So Crystal, it seems everybody is cooking at home, but what's, what's to be expected that this would be a more, um, more engaged audience in that regard? And um, yeah, keep firing away questions um, in the chat. And also in the Q&A, you can raise your hands. Uh, we'll get to you later. Crystal, thank you so much. Here's your audience. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here, Max. And it was awesome watching Floyd and Seth's presentations. I am um, honored to be able to follow behind them and um, use the knowledge that they presented to us. So I'm going to go ahead and get my presentation up right now. Yes, it's coming. It's coming in. Oh. Give me a second. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. No problem at all. We've been, you've been so patient with us, so we can be a little bit patient too. It was uh, very interesting discussions. They're still going on in the chat. Uh, also, I have to correct myself. It's high growing season in the South now, of course. And of course, the question is where's is the South? Is Baltimore part of the South? Big question here. Anyway, here we can see your slides now. Um, here we go. I'm going to mute myself. Awesome. Happy greetings, everyone. And so I'm just going to follow up on what Seth and Floyd spoke about um, in growing, feeding, and building community. So um, holistic wellness and health make, makes healthy living easy, nutritious, delicious, and fun with a focus on plant-based foods to help you live a healthier and more vibrant life. We offer healthy plant-based cooking classes, wellness workshops, health coaching, um, mindfulness meditation, and gardening consultation. So I um, it's a whole personal approach, and I work to improve food justice and sustainable food access. I teach people how to use rescued food, ugly food, and unfamiliar food in an easy and fun way. I'm a forager partner and volunteer urban farmer, and I love to teach foraging, wild food cooking, and farm to plate activities. I'm a certified permaculture designer and certified Baltimore City Master Gardener as well. So why is cooking important? So there are a lot of benefits to growing um, food. And so before I go into that, um, Seth brought up food as medicine. So I think that's one of the um, most important things is to think about like when you're cooking, but also thinking about your food, food is medicine. So we have mental benefits. Emotional benefits of cooking are vast. There are programs that use therapeutic cooking to help with mood disorders. So cooking also provides a creative outlet, which is beneficial for our mental health. And the mental effects are enhanced if you're cooking for others. It forms bonds with our friends and family. And cooking is a form of self-care and it can help boost your confidence and help with anxiety and depression. Um, I focus on teaching people easy recipes um, so that they're not anxious. Some people um, get concerned about cooking, so I try to find a nice, easy way, um, an easy approach so that they're not anxious when cooking. And uh, if you think about it, cooking can actually be a meditative practice and can actually ease the mind and relax the body. Some of the social benefits include um, a lot of cultures. Cooking is a way to bond with others. And um, you can show that you care by cooking for others. People cook in times of crisis, times of celebration, and to entertain and just nourish. For physical benefits, we have um, being able to maintain a healthy weight and maintain good gut health, which is important for our immune system, digestive system, and our mental health as well. And cooking and baking for yourself allows you to be more aware of what you're doing in your body and how it reacts to different foods, um, how your body reacts to different foods and dietary staples. And there's a study um, from um, studying chains of restaurants in Philadelphia where they found that the average meal, which is defined as an entree, a side dish, and a small appetizer, contains nearly 1,500 calories, and that was for one meal. What's more, these meals contain 28 grams of saturated fat and 3,512 milligrams of sodium. So adults are only supposed to consume at most 
13 grams of saturated fat per day and 2300 milligrams of sodium per day. So not only does eating out offer subpar nutrition, but it also doubles your chances of catching foodborne illnesses. So some of the financial benefits, um, cooking at home can save money. It can positively impact the person's overall financial situation. One of the major reasons for um, a lot of people to cook at home is financial. And according to um, Pricenomics study, um, ordering delivery costs an average of $20.37. So whenever people order, it is $20 per person that people are spending to order food. Um, in comparison, making a home-cooked meal can cost just $4.31. Um, so that's more than five times as expensive um, to eat out. And despite this knowledge, a lot of people um, still do spend a significant amount of money um, getting prepared foods outside of the home. In 2017, Americans spent $3,365 a year on food prepared away from home. When we consider that only 39% of Americans have $1,000 or more in savings, this is pretty. This is a pretty good reason to start cooking. Um, and then um, it was brought up in the poll about the meal kits. So cooking at home meal kits cost about three times the amount of actually getting your food um, from CSA or local markets and cooking the food yourself. Um, sometimes people think eating out is faster, but actually when you learn how to um, take the time to plan and cook and just make it a regular habit, you can actually cook meals a lot faster than it takes to call um, for someone to deliver food to you and have it delivered or to go out and actually go and order food or go to pick up food. So it can actually be faster um, to cook at home versus going out to get food. So changing our habits. Um, if we're going to make this shift to growing locally, we must also shift how we shop, prepare, and cook our foods. So um, definitely need to change our mindset around shopping and using local, local foods. So some of the things you can do is start by preparing your kitchen and cleaning your pantry, tossing out um, toxic foods, and then gathering recipes that use local and organic ingredients. Um, creating a shopping list based on what's available in your local area, and then plan your menus and schedule time to cook. So once you get all that food, you actually need to plan on using it um, to avoid food waste. And uh, sometimes people go shopping or get food in there like really excited and then they don't actually build enough time to prepare the food. Um, the better stock your um, pantry is, the easier it is to throw together a last minute meal. Um, so some of the things you can do for changing your habits is journal for clarity and stress reduction. And think about why you want to make the changes. So if you're changing um, because you are concerned about the environment, if you're making those changes for your health, um, political reasons, um, for your own wellness, for ethical reasons, for the animals, or for social justice. Um, just journaling what those reasons are. Um, and within social justice, you have the food access, inhumane human labor, and food sovereignty. And so um, some of the things when you're thinking about like, the food that you have, just mix matching um, recipes. So you don't have to follow the exact if you're just getting started, it might be a good idea to watch some YouTube videos, um, get someone to help you um, learn how to cook. And then you can just like, mix and match recipes together based on your flavors, um, the flavor profiles that you like. Um, another strategic approach is to use your leftovers and um, get creative with that as well. Some people don't like to eat the same thing um, every day, but you can change up with a basic meal and make it into something completely different based on the ingredients you had from the previous day. So definitely when you cook, you are more um, conscious of food waste as well. And so you can determine like, how much you need to cook, you have control over what you're putting in um, your meals. And if you are cooking like, bulk meals, you have control over that and you can freeze some of that as well. So um, organic practice, farming practices rely on nurturing the soil to grow crops. So you get actually more nutritious food from organically grown food. 
and research has shown that organic food is so nutritious that it's actually considered affordable. So a lot of times, um, something like an apple can cost three times the amount when you buy it organically. So financially, it's like you look at the apple and you're like, okay, do I want to spend a dollar or three um, dollars? But the organic apple has more um, phytonutrients and um, vitamins in it than a conventionally grown apple. A lot of times it's um, local, so the vitamins have not had a chance to um, diminish. The quality of the food hasn't diminished. The flavor hasn't diminished as well. And so um, buying food that's local and organic is actually, when you think about like the more vitamins, you're getting more nutrients, it's actually less expensive because you would have to eat three apples to get you know the, and the same amount of nutrients as one apple. Um, but you still end up spending basically the same amount of money. So it's better to just go in and get the quality um, if you can. Um, I tell people if you can't get organic, um, definitely wash the produce very well. Baking soda has been shown to remove a lot of pesticides and herbicides. So you can do a baking soda and or vinegar wash. So there are other options, especially when you're being um, mindful of your budget. But there's definitely that mindset shift change of um, thinking organic organic is expensive. A lot of times when your body is fully nourished, you feel full. So a lot of people will eat um, a lot like of, you know, you can eat several bags of chips and still feel hungry because you're not getting the nutrients that your body needs. So your body's going to continue to tell you, I need something. But when you eat um, food that's very high in nutrients and minerals, your body gets um, satisfied quickly, so you don't have to eat as much, and you feel satisfied, and your body's happy. Um, let's see. So overall, organic crops um, have 18 to 69 percent higher concentrations of antioxidants, and um, the antioxidants are important to protect our body from free radicals that can cause cancer, heart disease, and problems with our eyes, memory, and our mood. Um, and so, like I said earlier, just making sure that you are getting ready, your kitchen ready, and changing the mindset around shopping. So shopping local and what's in season. So we begin um, with local and seasonal produce in mind and repurpose leftovers into entirely um, new dishes that are easy and nourishing day after day. So it's good to know where you can purchase local food. Um, so we spot, we've brought up um, community-supported agriculture. You have your um, local markets that support um, regional farmers. And of course, going to know your, um, your own farmers in your area as well as farmers markets. So knowing what's in season, um, depending on where you are in the world, will um, let you know what you can have. Some countries do not have four seasons, but I'm going to speak mostly on um, America. And so if you're in the southern, southeastern part of the United States, um, so basically in mid-Atlantic, southeastern, there are certain foods that are available um, just in spring, some things summer, fall, and winter. So like for spring, you have um, Asian greens like topsoy and mizuna, salad greens, and um, a lot of our kale and collards and our brassicas are available as well. So you can make quick stir fries, soup, salads, as well as putting some of those greens in your smoothies. Um, strawberries are also available in the spring and celery. For the summer, we have our carrots and rainbow chard, as well as summer salad mixes with edible flowers. And you can make a salad with the tomatoes and cucumbers that are usually in more of abundance during this time, as well as summer squash and herbs. And for fruits, you have peaches, melons, and apples um, for some regions as well. And then fall, um, at the farmers markets, you'll see a lot of our ripe bell peppers, okra, eggplant, um, and you'll see cool weather greens like arugula, um, lettuce, bok choy, and mizuna. Um, you can also get your butternut squash. So this is a great time to get your um, hard winter squashes that store very well. And you can store a lot of these squashes for months um, in the right conditions. You can also take a lot of the produce and freeze it, um, chop it, freeze it. Or if you have a dehydrator, you can dehydrate um, as well. And then for the winter, we have um, 
kale, collards, mustard greens, um, as well as um, some of the Asian greens are still growing. And some people who have hoop houses are growing um, other plants and herbs right now as well. So where to source local? So um, Lloyd brought up container gardening and growing your own food. Depending on how much land you have, that can determine um, what you can grow. Also, um, homeowners associations can determine what you're able to do or not do um, with your land. So just knowing what the rules are for where you are. Um, but most places, at a minimum, you can grow in a container. Even if you have a studio apartment um, with no windows, you can grow in a container and grow herbs and grow um, the things in big buckets. So there's ways to um, find ways to just even grow just a little food um, yourself. The next best thing is our local farmers markets and community supported agriculture. It's great to know your farmers, um, learn their practices. You get to um, kind of see what they do on um, some farms so that you visit, not right now, but um, when that opens up again, you can check out the farms and just see their practices. Local markets, um, you can also go to local like, markets, like moms that support locally sourced produce. So that's um, some of the options. Um, and then when all else fails, just choose what's in season for your region. So some of the easiest ways um, to shop locally is to ask your farmers markets um, where they get that their people come from. So some markets only allow farmers from within 50 to 100 miles of where the farm stand is located. Um, others will have their market divided. So they will have an area that's just local vendors, and then they'll have another area for everyone. So it makes it easier to know who's in your immediate area and who you can shop um, from um, that's close to you. So you can um, use the kind of information just by stopping by the welcome desk or shopping online. In a lot of um, booths at the farmer's markets, they will have signs saying where the market is located. Um, so it brought up that a lot of CSAs filled up quite quickly um, this year. So um, a lot of CSAs, um, community supported agriculture, will, will open up enrollment in February, March, um, some in April. And because the pandemic started right around that time, um, there were a lot of CSAs that had the capacity to um, triple and more um, their capacity, and then others had to actually turn people away. Um, so if you're thinking about joining a CSA, this is the time to um, start looking into that. There are some that are actually starting to enroll already um, for next season. And then there are other CSAs that are all year long. So you can check to see what's available in that regard. So adapting recipes based on what's available. Um, and just learning to use your local produce for current recipes, adding new recipes to your cooking rotation, and joining support group or recipe group. So you can um, get together, like said earlier, get your grocery list together, sit down and prepare your menu in advance, um, and just choosing what's in season right now, you can determine what um, you can cook. So a website like Yumly, um, actually lets you put in what you have available, what produce you have, and it will um, put out recipes for you. And it also has um, the capability of dividing up by dietary um, restrictions. So if you're allergic to seafood, you can put that in there. If you're vegetarian, you can put that in. Um, really anything. So it's, it's a really awesome platform. And some of the stuff when you're doing um, shopping local, the food just tastes better. Um, it's more nutrient dense, just not fresher. So some of the advantage of, advantages of local food systems uh, include being able to get the nutrient dense food and know that your food is grown in a healthier soil. You're supporting your local farmers and producers, and this has a positive effect on our economy. Um, this also protects the environment. Our food is not having to travel long distances, um, using fossil fuels, and um, protect the environment by keeping our carbon in the soil here by growing local. 
Oh, and this is the eating in season helps you connect with your local environment and just um, like for it builds more connection as well. So building and supporting community. So local food or locally um, sourced food helps build the economy and it brings community. You get to know your farmer and it brings um, together lots of social benefits. So buying from local farms helps create jobs in your community and build resilience. Not only do farmers hire workers, they also shop, use services, and pay taxes where they live. When every region grows a variety of food, um, then a drought or attack in one region won't make the whole nation hungry. A strong food system makes it easier for us to help each other through hard times. So farms like um, White Lock Community Farm, the Plantation Park Heights, the Green of Garden, Cherry Hill Urban Farm, the Strength of Love Two, as well as um, Moon Valley Farm, they all have a strong tie in the community. Lots of them um, provide jobs and job training and training for farmers, as well as providing local produce to communities that otherwise would not have access to healthy um, produce. They also build community by having community events and um, helping having people have a place to go that's safe and um, welcoming. Then a lot of these um, farms also have um, their own market stands. Um, you can check out the websites and uh, Facebook pages to find out when they have their own farm stands. And um, a lot of them have CSAs. And they also um, teach our youth how to grow food. So I partner with organizations um, like the Black Vegetarian Society of Maryland, the Farm Alliance of Baltimore, Future Harvest, CASA, um, Tree Baltimore, um, to help you know, build that community and bring information and knowledge to the communities. And I'm also fully brought up, um, I am a community liaison and board member for the Baltimore City um, Master Gardeners. And so I um, definitely encourage people to look to the Maryland, um, University of Maryland Extension and whatever extension um, office um, where you're located for support and help. Um, all 50 states in the United States has extension offices where you can get um, information and knowledge to grow food. Um, there are programs that grow it, eat it, where you learn how to grow the food and cook it. So there are a lot of um, resources out there. And you can find places to build community and support. Um, you can also find ways to support a lot of these organizations um, with in-kind support, like editing videos or um, writing articles. You can provide labor. Um, some places provide um, sweat equity, where you can actually go to the farms and uh, learn how to do farming. And you'll get food um, like stipends or credits um, towards nice, healthy food in your um, community. So you're helping out your neighbors. You're helping out the farm and you're helping yourself as well. Um, you can share when um, organizations are having events, um, share it on Facebook or just word of mouth and just um, supporting each of these um, organizations, all the organizations in your area, just um, if not financially, then just, um, or in kind, letting people know what um, work they're doing and uh, supporting in that way. Uh, I um, am super fast, so I definitely want to build in time for questions, and we might still have time to do um, some other things as well. But let me put my contact information. Um, I'm available for questions during this time as well as after. I do focus um, a lot on teaching people how to eat healthy um, on a budget. Let me go back to this. Um, the top left, I'm at the Plantation Park Heights Urban Farm. Um, they do produce boxes um, every Thursday where they give um, free fresh produce boxes to the community. And I show people how to use that produce. Um, sometimes we get things in there that um, people are not familiar with. Um, and so instead of people getting boxes and um, you know, leaving something in the refrigerator for weeks and then it goes bad and they throw it away, they can um, you know, check out the videos we do do 
videos as well. So I'm there live, but we broadcast on Facebook and Instagram so that people can see um, how to use that produce that they're receiving. Same thing with CSA Share. Sometimes we get things in there that are just like, what is this? Um, and so if you can um, just kind of get familiar with a lot of the food, um, that's that's what actually where I come in is just getting people familiar with it and not being afraid to um, cook something like kohlrabi, which looks kind of weird, but it's just a brassica and you can um, cook it just like a lot of our other brassicas. Um, same thing with roasted veggies um, or root veggies. Um, one of the boxes I received recently, people could not figure out if it was a radish, turnip, or um, beet. <laughs> it's like, what is this big thing? Um, but if you are familiar with um, just cooking root veggies, you can, you know, you can roasted or stir fried, um, you do a lot of different things with it. It doesn't have to be scary. So just making it fun and accessible. Um, I'm picking up produce from White Lock Community Farm in the top right corner. Um, and that was for a cooking demo um, that I was going to do later um, on location there. Even during the pandemic, I've been able to do outside cooking demos, um, socially distance, where I'm still showing people how to use the produce. Um, and Every Monday and Friday, I go live on Facebook and YouTube for those who don't have Facebook to just show how to use the local produce. So in the picture bottom right, all of that squash actually came to Strength to Love to farm. Um, they had a surplus, and so I was able to grab some of that beautiful, gorgeous squash there. So um, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. I usually do at least one cooking video um, every week in the, on Fridays. Um, on Thursdays, I'm on location at the Plantation Park Heights on first and third Thursdays of the month, and we're going live on Instagram there. And then um, on Mondays, it's like uh, I'll, sometimes I'll do work, wellness workshops. I might do um, a little gardening, um, container gardening workshop or something on cooking as well. So make sure you're following at Holistic Wellness and Health. And I think that is it for me. So I will give us a little time here. So I'm Great. Sharing my screen. Great. Well, oh. thank you so much, Crystal. That was extremely, extremely interesting also to see what, what the different avenues of your work. It's very diverse and even for people who are not familiar with Baltimore, I think they got a good impression of what you're doing. Uh, so we have several questions here from, from participants already. And uh, I start with the first one that's a very practical one. Can you share your Instagram handle in the chat, please? Um, then they can directly. Marjorie was already so kind to put your Facebook uh information in there thank you marjorie and then there was also an a content related question which is very very important of course and yes and the comment also of course an amazing presentation i i think everybody we have a lot of very positive feedback here in the chat it's probably hard to read that while you're presenting but people did love it um, now how do you finance yourself do you get paid for these education sessions do you do is there a grant or is this volunteering work and this leads also into our later discussion uh, that we want to still add at the very end but how does it work as a business can you tell us some more about it yes so i um am a for-profit business a social um, enterprise and i work with a lot of nonprofits. So um, I am in partnership with the Farm Alliance of Baltimore and um, their collective of over 16 urban farms in Baltimore City. I um, get funded to do a lot of the cooking demos that I do in the community. So I will go to senior centers, to places that um, the people have aged out of foster care um, and to the farms directly to show people how to use the produce. And I, I source all of the produce from our local farms. So even um, during the winter time, sometimes it's a little hard to get some things, but a lot of the farms now have hoop houses, which is awesome, because I can get food um, from them all year and show people how to use that produce. 
So that's um, my major funder. I do do some volunteer um, work as well. So, um, but that's not sustainable. We live in a capitalistic society. So, um, but I did just recently, um, actually yesterday, got a grant from um, Mercy for Animals to do some education work at the Plantation Park Heights um, Urban Garden. So I'll be working with the youth there. So it's um, funding from other organizations that get funding. So that that's pretty much how I'm working. I do teach some um, cooking classes. And so of course, with um, everything that's going on, I'm not doing in-person hands-on cooking classes, but I will be doing a holiday themed cooking class next week. Um, um, it's a vegan cooking class. We'll be making a turkey list, loaf, sweet potatoes, all types of good yummy stuff. Um, people are asking me to do something. So that that's what I'm going to do. Um, that's a low cost course, but that is a, there's a cost associated with that. Whereas all of the other work I do, um, people can just show up. They can um, participate without having to worry about um, you know coming out of their pocket and that they still get that knowledge and education because I want it to be accessible. Um, I don't want people to feel like, um, especially now, I think that I've been doing this for about five years now. And I think that this year has been the most important um, in doing this work. So this was definitely not a time to hide. Um, it actually was a time for me to come out even more and show people how to use the produce because a lot of people joined CSAs who have never joined before. A lot of people were um, are getting these um, the free produce boxes and they genuinely don't know what to do with it. One of the farms I went to, a young man um, who works at the farm, was like he didn't even know what to do with a lot of the, the food himself. So he really appreciated because at first when the pandemic started, they were just ordering a lot of food um, out. And that's extremely expensive um, and it's not sustainable at all, especially when you're on a budget. Um, so yeah, that's, that's most of it. The, um, the funding is either people are paying for classes with me direct or I'm volunteering or I'm getting funding from an organization. Yeah, thank you for, for uh, explaining this. So also, if somebody wants to follow in your footsteps in other places, um, this, is, this is very exciting. So you said five years. Is the, is the company around already five years or how? how yeah? Yeah, over five years. Um, so I was going to do a celebration this year um, for my five years, but the didn't go quite that way. But um, yes, it's been five years officially as a company. Um, but I've been doing health and wellness education for over 20 years. Okay, but then here's your celebration. We all applaud. This is really great. Congratulations on five years. It's a milestone and it's also a milestone just to survive in these times as an economic entity. It's really tough year. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, here's a, now we go really into the depth. Earlier, you mentioned saturated fat. I was just listening, this coming from Aaron, I was just listening to a podcast from a leading functional medicine MD discussing fat and the fallacy of saturated fat promoted by the American Heart Association. They were saying that there isn't evidence-based data relating saturated fat to heart disease and they are in the process of removing those guidelines, suggesting that there's a limit on saturated fat. Have you read anything regarding this yet? And I think, Erin, this also links a lot then to the other aspect that's um, maybe sugar, but yeah. Um, uh, Crystal, this is really um, very, very specific, but of course, um, we, we said you're gonna talk about healthy food. So here are the questions that we wanna hear more. So I actually have not heard this um, this particular study, so I need to, to look that up. But saturated, saturated fat has been shown to raise cholesterol and um, actually cause um, cardiovascular issues. So I'll be interested to find out what they're saying specifically about um, that. Because, I mean, avocados contain saturated fat, coconut. Um, oil is the saturated fat. So there are like plant sources of this. Um, but yeah, I, I need to, to look that up because I've, that's my first time hearing that. But they're always changing things and changing data. And a lot of it's political. So you have to know why they did the research and what they what their end goal is. Um, what Why did they do this research? And um, yeah, and 
guess who who is it benefiting? So like right. they'll say like dairy is good for you, but most um, African Americans and Latinx people are lactose intolerant, and a lot of people are allergic to dairy. Um, and so, but a lot of that research is funded by the Dairy Council. So you need to know who's funding, you know, the research, why they're funding it, um, what's their end goal, their game there. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll look into that just out of curiosity in case I get that question again. Um, yeah. And same thing with sugar, like there are a lot of different things um, about sugar, debates about the sugar, um, how much we can consume, what's um, good sugar, what's, uh, you know, not so good sugar, eating whole foods, like sugars, like dates, the whole food, very sweet thing versus very processed um, bleached sugar. So um, yeah, that there's still a lot of data suggesting that too much sugar um, causes a lot of harm to our cardiovascular system as well. Um, when the sugar is not processed, it can actually cut, it's like glass in your bloodstream. You can actually cut your um, the lining of your arteries and then it builds a plaque and then it causes all types of other issues. So um, I, I'm definitely pretty sure the sugar, like too much sugar is bad. If you can't um, use it, because sugar is one of those energy sources that's meant to be used immediately, um, not to uh, store or anything like that because then it becomes fat and causes other issues. Yeah, um, fructose is different than glucose. Yes, definitely. Um, and how it's absorbed in our bodies and how it reacts, even though all overall it's an oast it's a sugar the way our body reacts to certain sugars are different like um uh, agave is definitely super sweet but it has a low glycemic index so it reacts differently in your body than even maple syrup which has a lot of minerals very interesting no and thank you for sharing this you said it in the beginning in your presentation the caloric um impact of ordering food uh, for, for takeout or delivery and how restaurant food, and it's totally true, right? You, you usually don't know how much is in there, only from the big chains, they need to publish uh, the nutritional information. But if you get anything from a smaller restaurant, they don't have to give any of that information and they might not know it either. <laughs> and so yeah. you're, you're probably eating both in terms of what's in there and in the amount, not what you would do at home uh, if you have actually seen what you pour into the pot or pan. So this is kind of interesting. I I can uh, I can see that, and I think it's of course scary the trend to not cooking at home. I mean, this is really increasingly that people don't even know how to cook simple things and. I think what you're doing, your work is so essential, um, you know, getting people back into the habit or just spreading the knowledge of just what do I do with, uh, or what is that even to begin with, right? You said, is it a, um, a, a radish or is it a beet? People didn't know and, and then they had no clue what to do with it because probably a, a beet you wouldn't, or, or like a rutabaga, you wouldn't want to eat it raw necessarily, or most people wouldn't, um, but a radish you might want to. Um, so let's see, are there more questions in the, uh, in the chat? There's of course a lot of comment, um, but if people have questions, you can also ask them yourself. You can unmute yourself. This is very, um, very interactive here. You can also raise your hand or you can just say uh, what, what you want uh, to say in the chat, of course. So there was a question about um, coconut oil, whether it should not be used that much because it has a lot of highly saturated fats in it. That's a question. I don't know, Crystal, do, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I'd love coconut oil, but yes, you definitely, um, it's a high calorie um, product and you want to use it sparingly. It's not something you want to use a lot of um, every day. It is extremely saturated. Um, and I, I love it for everything though, from hair and skin to eating is a great oil, but you do have to be um, careful, like not to eat so much of it. Um, just because it's considered a healthier oil, doesn't mean um, you should consume a lot. 
And then there's a lot of debate on consuming oil at all. There are people who are truly strict whole food plant-based that do not believe in using anything processed and oil is processed. Right. Um, whenever we take something away from its whole, um, you're changing something and it changes the way your body might react to it. So some people bodies actually um, react negatively to oil and it can cause inflammation. And so uh, sugar causes inflammation, too much oil can cause um, inflammation when it's not, like when you eat a walnut, walnut is very high in fat, but you're also getting the fiber and the protein and the sugar, everything that's in that walnut. But when you extract it and get walnut oil, that actually acts differently in your body. Right. And that also links back to the whole idea of eating local and seasonal. Of course, in Baltimore, coconuts are not very local and seasonal. And so it sometimes is very tough, you know, especially, I mean, I grew up in, in Berlin, Germany, and there the winter really is like, you know, you have a very limited, <laughs> limited range of what's seasonal and local then. I mean, you have cabbage, um, you have, of course, kale, winter kale, and uh, potatoes in, in, in the basement stores, and then onions and things like that. But it's very difficult to get anything that's luxurious. So um, yeah, that's, that's a challenge to be always local. Of course, if you're in a warmer climate, you have more choices. So um, let's see, there's a lot of new questions or comments. I saw somebody saying something. Um, well, let's just see, there's more information. Um, okay, so we see we'll have coconuts soon, tropical greenhouses. And it is true, I actually heard from um, a man, he's growing bananas in the Rockies in Colorado. So. Uh, high altitude in a greenhouse, of course. So this is not in the open. Uh, so this is kind of fun. You can do a lot. And I know there's been articles about people growing uh, tropical fruit in greenhouses uh, in, in Minnesota. And you just have to make sure they get some sunshine. In, and, and of course, then it's the question about heating the place. And uh, Seth had some great ideas there with a the solar thermal. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to try that too. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of exciting if you, if you can actually grow things locally. And of course, um, we need to also see how local, how local we want to be, because of course, for some farming communities abroad, that's also very important to sell coconut to us and that's also, that's their live livelihood. So that's also important. But I think it's it's great to see what you're, what you're doing. Also, the discussion here is very active on the sugar fat side. It's, it's like, but it's not everything. Food is not just about sugar and fat. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting what you said. It's not just the um, actual nutrient. So if we're talking about fat values, but it's the uh, the micronutrients around it, if I can simplify, like what you said with the walnut, right? You can, if you eat the whole walnut, you get so much more than having the, the compressed uh, oil that comes out of it. And I think that's true probably uh, for a lot of products, fruit juices versus eating a real fruit, et cetera. And, and you just concentrate certain aspects of the nutrient and you get rid of a lot of the fiber and the micronutrients. Um, so I think that's a lot, you said in the beginning, change of mindset. And I think that that's really like a big thing because we're used to having things like little snacks and plastic that we just grab and eat right away, right? So there's no thought process in this basically. And um, if, you, if you look at some of these energy bars, I mean, it's really, really high, high sugar. And even if, even if they're organic and, and healthy labeled, it's still not exactly the same as eating uh, seasonal fresh homemade foods. Um, great. If we, 
I think it's like an endless. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna copy the whole chat um, and maybe make this available at least among the participants. It's a very rich source, so don't worry if you haven't read all the comments in the chat. We have about 20 minutes left, and I don't want to go over time too much. Yeah, there was actually a question. Could you please copy the chat? Yes, we will We will do that. We'll share the chat um, just with you guys, not, not with the whole world. Any links and, and um, links to videos or, or websites that you posted here, I'll be so... Um, I will actually copy these and post these with the recording. There'll be a recording of this event here today. So we'll have for later for people, if you want to rewatch it or if you want to show it to people, we'll have that online. This will take a little bit because I'll have the whole thing and then I split it up in the three sessions. And then uh, you can find that online. I'll show you, I'll send you the information for that as well. We wanted to um, have as, at the end a very short uh, round with our three speakers. Crystal, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you. Applause to Crystal. Uh, thank you so much for presenting. This was really phenomenal. And I think the amount of uh, comments in the chat shows you that you really touched um, on a very important topic there. I think a lot of people will come and watch your online classes on YouTube and on Facebook. So you said they're Wednesdays, is that correct? Monday and Friday. Mo Monday and Friday, sorry, got this wrong. Okay, Monday and Friday, is it a specific time or do you change it? 5 p.m. Eastern time, I call it live at five. Live at five, oh, that's why it was live at five under the photo. Okay, get this now. 5 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Good. Okay. So everybody has this now. Live at five on your Facebook. And of course, everybody go ahead and like the Facebook and of course the Instagram and and your and subscribe to your YouTube channel. And then um, that will also help push out the word. And also think about um, we talked about the need for starting to grow, to farm wherever you are. But of course we can also think about what you're doing. That kind of business is so important if we can do this also in other places. I think there's tons of places that are in need of having this whole system approach because you're so right. You, you, you talked about the, the guy working at the farm who was farming this, but then didn't know what to do with it, right? So that's only part of the equation is to grow it. The next step is people need to know what to do with it. Um, and, and just a reminder of people in the US, and this is the official government numbers, we throw away about 40% of food gets thrown away. And that's probably a low number because it's a USDA number. <laughs> so it's probably um, trying to kind of go on the nicer side of, of the spectrum. But uh, so it's a lot, in other words. It's a lot of food that gets tossed away, either because people forget about it or or they don't like it anymore. And it's it's so important to know what you said in the beginning, organizing your pantry and your kitchen so you can actually use that. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, we could probably do a whole work on this, a whole day on this, a uh, whole workshop, I meant to say. 